Welcome to the second episode of Business Chronicles by Rogers Capital Tax. I am Pelo Vyagni Hotri. And I'm Robbie Tarani. And today's show comprises of two parts. An in-depth interview with the CEO of Mauritius Finance, Samad Juman. Followed by a discussion with the Managing Director of Rogers Capital Tax, Ryan Alas, about a recent Privy Council judgment. Welcome Samad. Pleasure having you here on this platform today. We are excited to hear about your enriching experiences. Let's delve into this interview, shall we? Thank you. Thank you for having me on this show and happy to proceed. Given your extensive experience and knowledge in the financial sector, both nationally and internationally, could you share with our viewers your experience and how they have influenced your perspective on the Mauritius International Financial Center? Thank you. Actually, um, you know, when you look at the IFCs around the world, most of them have some unique positioning geographically. If you look at the Channel Island, it's based within closeness to the UK, and a lot of structures that is happening within the uh, Channel Island has got some direct link with the UK. Likewise, you look at Singapore today, it's uh, a, the IFC of the region, mostly for uh, Asia and um, the China. And likewise, if you look at uh, um, what's happening in the Euro, Luxembourg seems to be the place for the European structures. When you look at Mauritius, we are actually very closely linked to Africa, but we are in the middle between Asia and Africa. So uh, over the years, if you look at Mauritius, we have actually been the drivers of investment and a also FDIs across the continent, whether it's uh, India or Africa. So much so that over the years we have contributed more than $150 billion in India alone and almost $80 billion over the continent across Africa. So what you've seen is what I've learned is depending on your geographical location, there's always the contribution that you can bring to the region and beyond. So um, how has Mauritius grown in uh, the African economy, uh, specifically on strategic uh, capital flow management? As I mentioned earlier, and based on a study carried out by Capital Economics, and it's demonstrated that Mauritius has contributed more than $80 billion on the continent alone. And why that is because today we have built an ecosystem which has taken a long time. As you're aware, Mauritius started back in the early 1990s as a very modest IFC, targeting at that point in time mostly uh, India. But over the years, after 30 years of celebration that we did last year, you can see we have become a tried and tested and proven jurisdiction for investors. What it means that we have the full ecosystem, whether it's legal, was it in terms of uh, the investment flows, was it in terms of banking, was it in terms of bringing the best international practices. So as a result, it has helped uh, the country to attract investors to go into the continent, whether it's Africa, whether it's India. Now, why does people use an IFC instead of going directly? As you're aware, Africa is a continent of 54 countries. So each one has their own laws, own requirements, own restrictions, and own risk attached to each one of them. So the first thing any investors would ask before going into a new place, the first question they ask themselves is, how do I get out? If there are restrictions in getting out, they won't even go in. That's what we provide through the ecosystem by allowing investors to use a jurisdiction to facilitate the investment across multiple countries on the continent, but also make it easy for them to take their money out and free repatriation of profit. This is how we help. So Mauritius has uh, emerged as a potential player in the realm of VCC funds, viable capital uh, company funds. Uh, could you share your insights 
on how Mauritius facilitates and fosters a conducive environment for VCC funds to thrive as compared to other jurisdictions. VCC, which stands for Variable Capital Companies, uh, which you will be aware of, is not new. It's something that has been available over the last few years. It has been introduced uh, recently in Mauritius. It goes back to 2002 when the VCC Act was actually introduced. So the VCC actually uh, that we have here in Mauritius is completely different to what already exists elsewhere. So basically the VCC in Mauritius has got something which is unique, which is called the separate legal personality. So within a VCC structure, which is meant mostly for fund structures, the VCC has a legal personality. Each sub-funds that comes underneath the VCC have their own legal personality. And likewise, you have the SPV, which can have a separate legal personality. So by having a separate legal personality, it gives a lot of flexibilities for promoters, fund managers, in terms of how you structure your fund vehicle. So the VCC in Mauritius is not only uh, conducive, but also it gives the opportunity and the flexibility to promoters to be able to launch a new sub-fund in a very short time period. Why that? Because once the VCC is licensed, it's all the parties within the VCC is already re recognized and known to the Commission. So as a result, when you're launching a new sub-fund, it takes less time compared to having a new fund on the market. Now, the fact that a VCC gives you the flexibility of having the same governance, the same AML framework, and likewise, you can also have the same compliance officers and MLROs. So this helps in reducing down the cost of the structures of new funds and existing funds. Likewise, if you want to launch a new uh, sub-fund, the license fees also is a lot less compared to having uh, a new fund structures from the beginning. So the flexibility is in terms of uh, cost, in terms of time going to the market, and also the fact that it has a separate legal personality, it gives proper protection to investors. So all the assets in each sub-fund are properly ring fenced for the benefit of the investors. So if I may say that must be uh, very attractive to investors then? Definitely, uh, uh, mostly uh, new funds that are being set up in Mauritius are being set up under the VCC structure. But even though uh, I, we have even recently in the last um, a budget in the Finance uh, Act, which came out a couple of weeks ago, now we have actually extended the use of a VCC for family office licenses. So which means a single family office, a multiple family office will be able to use the VCC structure for setting up uh, the family office in Mauritius. So we can say that the Mauritian regulatory framework supports the growth of VCC funds. Definitely, and we hope to see a lot more in the near future. And as oh, there have been some amendments recently on uh, the debt fund side, whereby a debt fund, the income received by a debt fund, which is mostly interest, would benefit from a 95% um, exemption, partial exemption, which means an effective rate of 0.75% across debt fund, and we would see more and more debt fund being set up in the jurisdiction. As you know, a lot of uh, um, the infrastructure across the continent or even India which is being financed through debt, and we hope that we will help in terms of structuring going forward. Investment in Africa holds significant potential. Mm -hmm. Could you shed light on the initiatives and strategies Mauritius has put into place to attract and solidify investment towards African continent? You see, there's a lot of uh, um, development happening on the continent. Africa is a continent which is booming. It's got a population of in excess of 1.5 billion people and the fastest growing population in the world. But likewise, you've got countries who are, um, has got double-digit increase in their GDPs, and this is going to attract a lot of uh, investment. Why? Because there's an increase in consumption, there's an increase in uh, a need for infrastructure, whether it's through uh, medical facilities, uh, road, uh, power uh, generation. So through all these increase in demand, we've seen a lot of investors targeting Africa. 
So today, the fact that we provide the conducive ecosystem for the continent, I can tell you clearly today we have more than 75, uh, more than 70% of the DFI's money going into Africa are structured through Mauritius. Why? We give the investment protection. And likewise, many of the multinationals who are investing pan Africa use Mauritius because it provides them the possibility not only for structuring, but also the possibility of doing their regional headquarters in Mauritius and also their um, a treasury functions out of Mauritius. So we have the ecosystem with not only uh, a, the management companies, the law firms, but also the possibility of using the local banks, the regional banks and multinationals who can actually provide the full service for the treasury functions of these companies. We know that every nation faces challenges and Mauritius is no exception. What are, in your opinion, the current challenges Mauritius is facing? I'm not going to go into a, uh, a list of challenges. And uh, one thing that is uh, we have demonstrated as Mauritius being small, agile and nimble, it has actually allowed us to be able to sit around the table, sort out our differences and get out of our uh, e issues that we are facing. But actually this is one main uh, challenge that we currently facing. That is also us by being victim of our own success. That's human capital. So if you look at it today, a, a lot of professionals are actually uh, going to work in other IFCs because our experiences, our people that are being uh, trained and getting the support by working for multinationals are being attracted to work in other jurisdictions. That is one challenge that we are currently facing. And also to make it uh, uh, worse, I would say, is uh, our demographics. We are an aging population, a population of 1.3 million people. And uh, if you look at our fertility rate, it's currently at 1.3. If you want to have a replacement within your population, it has to be 2.3. So we are among the top 20 countries in the world in terms of our level of uh, fertility rate. So the only way to address this is to try and attract new people to come to work. This is a major challenge that we are facing and hence the need for capacity building. Perhaps we have an issue of brain drain as well? The brain drain is as a result of, once again, is people getting the exposure here, which is recognized internationally. So it's an issue that other IFCs are also facing. So as a result, the easiest way is to attract people from other jurisdictions to come and work for them. So we just need to continue to promote and get new people in the industry, get new blood, and have a proper um, a strategy in place to not stop the brain drain, but at least to continue to get new people joining the sector. So what, according to you, um, should we implement or put forward to retain the talents or attract mm -hmm. people coming to Mauritius actually to, to work for them and to boost the economy, I must say? Once again, I'm con uh, you can't prevent people from leaving if they want to leave. I was one of them. Uh, I left the country 15 years ago, but I decided to come back. And even if you get 10% of those who's left who come back, it's going to contribute to the country. However, what we need to do is we need to increase the supply. If your fertility rate is low, you don't expect the supply within the country to increase. So the only way is we've seen it announced in the budget recently, whereby the government is opening up by reducing the salary for occupation permit holders. So we have Africa, which is next door to us, with a number of talents available to be recruited. So I think what we need to do is, uh, in order to make up for the shortfall, we need to ensure that we can bring in people with experience, whether it's from India, whether it's from Africa, whether it's from any country in the world who are willing to come to Mauritius, take advantage of the incentive under the new occupation permit. That's one. And secondly, you will recall that Mauritius is also an education hub. Mm -hmm. So with international universities now in Mauritius, and we've seen students from Africa, from uh, Asia, coming to study in Mauritius. And for a UK degree, for UK qualifications. What we've done also is allow those foreign students who are coming to study in Mauritius, they are eligible of their, their studies to stay for a minimum of three years. And, uh, and a young professional work permit allows them to work, get the exposure, 
And once you've got the exposure, they can convert that into an occupation permit for 10 years and stay in the country. So basically, there are strategies in place which eventually will build up the capacity, not only for financial services, but across all sectors in the economy. So as the CEO of Mauritius Finance, your position in leadership plays a crucial role in shaping the financial landscape. Could you tell us more about your mandate and how regrouping members under one roof is contributing to the greater vision of economic growth in the region? Uh, interesting question, because if you look at it today, um, the ecosystem has grown over the last 30 years. So you have a lot of uh, uh, subsectors within the financial services industry itself. And uh, our mandate is to bring everyone within the ecosystem together. So today, among our membership based, we have more than 160 members, which includes management companies, accounting firms, law firms, banks, asset managers, fund managers, investment advisor, investment dealer brokers, and even the stock exchange is a member of Mauritius Finance. So as you can see, we bring together all the subsectors within the industry. And the idea is to uh, sit around the table, work in the best interest of this sector. So our first mandate is uh, for advocacy, which allow us to work very closely with the regulators, whether it's the Bank of Mauritius, the Financial Services Commission, the uh, Revenue, Mauritius Revenue Authority, the Registrar of Companies, and even the EDB, and with all the ministries, including the Ministry, obviously, Ministry of Financial Services and the Ministry of Finance. So we work very closely, and we have a lot of committees, technical committees that have been set up, whereby Mauritius Finance is a member. So we get to provide a platform for our members to ensure they bring in the issues forward and bring the best practices within the jurisdiction. That's first. And secondly, we talked about capacity building earlier. Mauritius Finance also have a training institution license, and we use that to uh, build the capacity within the industry by upskilling and also by bringing a new entrants on the market. Thirdly, we have a mandate for promotion of the IFC, and we work very closely with the EDB, Economic Development Board of Mauritius, to do the promotion of the Mauritius IFC across the world. And the last one is about the development of the Mauritius IFC. So any uh, a new products and services that we think is worth introducing is to make us, take us to the next level. This is where we work closely with experts, whether it's in the industry or internationally, to uh, make recommendation and suggestion to the government and the regulators. That's a bit how we help in shaping uh, the industry and also uh, look at what's happening in the future. So we contributed equally on the uh, blueprint for financial services mm -hmm. and we also helped in the implementation of the recommendation of that blueprint. You just mentioned trainings provided by Mauritius Finance. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us more about the different types of trainings provided by Mauritius Finance? Okay, so we do a few things. Firstly, for uh, new entrants, we do capacity building. And with the support of the HRDC, we do a lot of uh, um, the trainings to bring in people who are unemployed within the sector. That's for areas where there's a huge demand, such as, uh, I would say, fund accounting, uh, areas like uh, a compliance. We've done several of those over the last few years. Secondly, we do workshops for upskilling. Upskilling for existing professionals in the sector to upskill from uh, what's happening uh, internationally or new laws and regulations, but also a new uh, set of skills that's required in today's world. And for thirdly, what we've done is we have signed agreements with several international uh, institutions, including the ICA, International Compliance Association for Compliance Qualification, with CISI for a lot of trainings and CPDs. We've done similarly uh, signed an agreement with um, STEP worldwide for trust and foundations. And we've signed another agreement with uh, a CLTI for uh, fund accounting and administration certificates. So all these trainings are internationally recognized. Some of them are also being offered in collaboration with Alliance Business School of Manchester University. So over and above trainings, we have qualifications, which is completely relevant with the sector. Mm -hmm. So we try to bring this to the industry and also uh, to new entrants. So we talk to university graduates, uh, we go to um, the, some career talks at uh, schools and colleges 
to uh, demonstrate the opportunities and uh, that are available in the sector. When people are deciding in terms of the career paths in the future, at least they have this visibility, which allows them to uh, know a little bit more what to expect and where would they see themselves a few years down the line, should they be interested in joining financial services sector in Mauritius. Well, thank you, Samad, for sharing your experience and valuable insights on the Mauritius financial services sector, as well as the Mauritius finance. It was a pleasure having you on this platform, and uh, thank you again. Thank you, Samad. Pleasure is mine. Thank you. We shall now move on to the next part of our talk show. Whereby Managing Director of Rogers Capital Tax, Ryan Denis Salas, will share with us a recent judgment from the Privy Council, namely Blue Lagoon Hotel. Welcome, Ryan. We understand that you have an interesting Privy Council judgment to discuss with us today. The Privy Council recently delivered a judgment in the case of Blue Lagoon Hotel and the Director General of the Mauritius Revenue Authority. Can you tell us what was the issue in this case? Sure, Pervi. The main issue in the appeal is whether Blue Lagoon Beach Hotel is liable to account for value-added tax on payment received from two operators for reserve rooms that were not actually occupied by guests. Blue Lagoon argues that there is no supply of services if no guest arrives, while the MRA argues that the reservation of the room constitutes a supply of services. The board ultimately agrees with the MRA, stating that the service provided by Blue Lagoon to the two operators is a reservation of accommodation, and the payment received is directly linked to the service. So, having determined there is a supply, how does the Privy Council's judgment address the issue of whether the supply is zero rated or taxable at, the, at standard rate? Unfortunately, Robbie, the Privy Council could net could not delve into the issue of whether the supply is zero rated or not, due to it being raised by Blue Lagoon at a late stage, only a few days before the hearing. Therefore, although the Privy Council judgment settles the debate regarding the existence of a supply, it does not provide a resolution on the rate at which the VAT should be charged on the service provided by Blue Lagoon to the overseas two operators. According to your analysis, what is the significance of the judgment of the Privy Council? The Privy Council's reasoning in the Blue Lagoon Beach Hotel VAT assessment appeal emphasizes the need for a legal relationship between the provider of the service and the recipient. It is co also considered that the term supply of services may, must be interpreted objectively without regard to the purpose or result of the transaction concerned and without being necessary for the tax authorities to carry out inquiries to determine the intention of the taxable person. This is in line with the OECD international VAT guidelines. However, this is in contradiction with the approach adopted by the Supreme Court in the FRCI case. In the case of FRCI, the Supreme Court inquired on who was the ultimate consumer, disregarding the existence of two distinct legal relationships between, on one side, FSA and its overseas client, and between the latter and his Mauritian client. That's very interesting, Ryan. Do you think the judgment would have been different if the payments were refundable? If it is refundable, then it is more likely to be a deposit. Based on the reasoning and case laws relied upon by the board, it is unlikely that there would be a supply. In any case, there would have been only a timing difference as any VAT collected from the client would need to be reimbursed with the VAT upon cancellation. Thank you, Ryan. My pleasure. Thank you, Ryan. We now come to the end of the second episode of Business Chronicles Talk Show. See, See you in the, the next, next one. one.